So what she was asking is, I started with food. I had a good food response in my dog through my markers. As I progressed in training, I had a toy dog. So we start to switch to a toy. My dog's arousal response or response to my marker increases in intensity because now it predicts a higher value reward for them. So now they're more intense about their work in general. If I go back to food at that point, consistently, will it come down again? And the answer is yes, it will. It'll come down if I consistently do that, right? If I do it once or twice, it won't, and I'm back to the other. Or more likely what we do at a certain point, and I'll, I'll get into more of this a little bit later, but at what we're more likely to do is use a certain type of reward for a certain behavior. So I can condition it to location, I can condition it to training in general, I condition it to my markers. I can also condition it to different behaviors. So if I'm doing downstays, maybe I want you in a lower arousal level. So I use a lower value food reward to go and reinforce your downstays for a certain dog. And maybe for healing, I want you, or recalls, I want you super jacked up, so I use higher value food or toys there. With, so if I recall my dog, they're expecting a toy. If I'm doing a downstay, they're expecting a piece of food, right? And so that expectation controls the arousal level connected to that exercise or that behavior specifically. Would I avoid uh, using toy rewards for dogs that get overly aroused for toys, uh, would I avoid using those in training? It depends on what I'm gonna do with the dog. So for my personal dogs, and this is something we'll talk about a little bit as we go along as well, I want them to learn to listen to me in very high states of arousal. It's essential to what we, we do as we go forward. So one of the issues I find with the, the kind of current pet dog model it's a long time pet dog model where people are trying to keep dogs from ever getting excited. Don't play ball with your dog. You're activating their pred predatory responses. You're creating arousal level that's gonna potentially be problematic. So keep the dog at low arousal level all the time. Every time they get excited, put your thumb on them. Don't let them do this. The issue with that is what I talked about before. What, is that fair to the dog? But also, it's almost impossible with a certain kind of dog a certain type of dog that you're not going to be able to take them through life without them ever getting excited. And so for me, toy rewards and toys in my training are one of the ways in which I teach dogs to listen to me in high states of arousal. So my dog gets super jacked up because it wants to chase squirrels or it gets super fired up over other dogs, right? I don't want to go out and deal with the problem there, right? Because I don't have control of those things. Right? I do it in a controlled setting where I can control the arousal level. And so play, we'll talk about play a little bit tomorrow when we talk about motivation. Uh, and play is one of the ways we motivate dogs. So play can obviously be a reward, right? So why do we play with our dogs? One, it can be a reward for behavior. So if I teach my dog how to play, then I can use that game to reinforce behavior, just like I would food, right? But other reasons to use play, potentially. One, we exercise dogs, right? Our dogs need to burn up energy. I can have them burn up energy by cutting them loose and letting them chase squirrels around the backyard. They're burning up energy, right? But that's burning up energy in a way that does not serve me and my relationship with my dog and actually may hinder my relationship with my dog. My dog now doesn't care about me at all, cares about squirrels. So if I interactively play with you, I meet your exercise and energy requirements while building a relationship makes the dog want to focus on me and do things with me. So the ben I'm satisfying your, your, your need to expend energy while building relationship. But the most important thing in my mind and the most overlooked is teaching dogs to listen to you in high states of arousal. And so play is a perfect laboratory. So I teach you to play. Now you're getting excited about it. Now I start to bring in the rules. Oh, by the way, you have to let go. When I say let go, you have to bring it back to me. You have to wait until I tell you to grab it. And I can do impulse control stuff around play. And it allows me to set up situations where that dog can learn when it's excited and focused on things externally to listen to me. And that carries over into other situations, right? If your dog sees another dog down the street and gets all excited and won't sit, I can teach the dog to sit or look at me or heal or come back to me. I throw a toy out on the ground and my dog's like, ooh, and I say, you have to sit first to go get it. You have to turn and look at me to go get it. You know, right? Now I have all these ways of setting up situations that are gonna look like other potential situations. It's not a perfect carryover, but that dog then gets to learn to listen to me when they're stimulated and excited. And I think that's one of the most overlooked benefits of play. Like, People say, oh yeah, I exercise my dog, it burns up energy so they're easier to live with because you made them tired, all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, in sport work, we use it as a reward. But the fact that you're, we use it as a mini laboratory to teach the structure of all kinds of behaviors. And I start out with lower arousal, I start out with food, 
and then I crank it up a little, dynamic food, then I crank it up a little more, and then I use a toy, and then I use, then eventually I may back tie my dog on something, and, or have somebody hold my dog, and I tease them with a the toy until they're barking and going crazy, and then I go down, and they have to lay down. And I deliver, I didn't start there, of course, I built it up a little bit at a time. Now I've got you frothing at the mouth, and I can say down, and they go Hoop. Okay, if you want, and if you don't want it, your toy, you don't get this unless you lay down, sorry, dude. And so I can build to the point where my dog can be extremely aroused and still listen to me. And this is one of the ways in which I think the sport dog world can inform certain situations of pet dog training. You wouldn't want to do that with every dog, and you couldn't necessarily. There are dogs that have behavioral issues and pet dog work and things like that that won't play with toys either. So it's not an absolute that we can use in every situation, but if I have a dog that will play, it offers me a lot of potential benefits there, yes. For, sure. So four months old, you don't know anything yet, right? So <laughs> developmental stages are, and maturity rates are wildly different for different dogs. We'll talk about this tomorrow a lot when we talk about motivation. But some dogs aren't showing interest, and they turn on at various stages, right? So absolutely, our dogs learn to play. You can't force a dog to play that has no impulse to, right? And outside of puppyhood and adolescence, it gets harder. Somebody comes to you with a three-year-old dog that's never played, and you say, can we teach it to play? Uh, probably not if it's not expressing an interest there, or probably not with the kind of intensity that we're expecting. You may get a little bit, but you're unlikely to change that completely right, as you go. But lots of dogs, there's puppies that don't appear interested, it's then seven months they do, eight months, ten months, a year old, suddenly it's somebody. You see, I used to see a lot of it. Certain breeds are notorious for being really fiery when they're young. Malinois puppies can be really fiery when they're little. You have a seven-week-old seven Malinois that wants to chase everything that's moving. Uh, border Collies are, tend to be very active early. And other breeds, like when I had German Shepherds, lots of the German Shepherds, before they changed their teeth as little puppies, showed no interest. I'd, you'd wave something around and they'd be like, whatever. And then when, after they finished changing their teeth, they're seven, eight, nine months old, it's like, all of a sudden they'd be into it, right? So what you can do is obviously fan the flames of what's there. I can give the dog opportunities. If the dog shows an interest, I can create and intensify this. And we'll, we'll talk about this more tomorrow when we start talking about motivation. But yeah, absolutely, they can learn.